Here we have the material beginning for this project, a not so modest slab of bubinga. The slab was cut in half, and then one of those halves in half again. Those uh, quarters became a pair of small tables. The remainder was to become the project described here, which is a sideboard. A pair of rip cuts defined the quarter sawn sections of this slab, which were then used for the doors on the front. I added to the material by obtaining yet more quarter sawn and uh, with thick slab stock. Here's some eight quarter stock and a very wide quarter sawn board of bubinga. Yet more quarter sawn bubinga in 20 plus inch widths. Yet more was required besides that, and uh, I also bought a secondary wood, uh, Shedua, to uh, use for drawers and uh, other accents. The giant slab was the client's, while the rest of the bubinga was from my own stock, so we made an agreement to build two identical cabinets, and this is the design. Here a SketchUp animation shows the essential components of the cabinet, how it breaks down into three units, a stand, carcass, and a bonnet top. Before we get going with the assembly, I'd like to show a scene from another video I took uh, posted during the construction phase to uh, show how some of this cabinet went together uh, because in the assembly you'll see later this piece has already been put together so it may not be obvious what went into the construction.
After a whole bunch of fabrication work, assembly begins with the pillow blocks, which are an architectural borrowing employed both on the side at coffee table and the cabinets. While this is a heavy cabinet, in this case the use of pillow blocks is more a visual tie to the earlier side table and coffee table I built. Pillow blocks are set aside and next up are the red brass leveler feet which I had cast and then I machined, fitted these adjusting bolts with a circlip or spring clip. This allows the feet to be adjusted to an uneven floor surface. Those leveler feet mount into the posts by way of a threaded insert that is uh, fitted to the bottom of the post. There's also a square mortise to receive the top of the leveler foot, as you can see here. The square mortise for the leveler foot keeps it from rotating out of position. Stretchers for the stand follow the same aesthetic pattern as for the side table and coffee table. What I'm doing here is uh, fitting the stretcher so I can mark out the location of the peg using a hollow chisel. Uh, after this step is complete, the tenon is mortised for that peg. Here I like to let the joinery do the work. I feel a drawboard pegged connection is perfectly adequate to resist all loads imposed on it to uh, perform well through seasonal moisture changes, so I don't use any glue. Pegs are made of yatoba, that's a slightly harder and stiffer wood than bubinga. The pillow block pairs you saw assembled earlier in this video can now be placed. They sit atop a tenon on the post. 
This next assembly is a sill in regards to the cabinet box, but it actually caps the stand. Here's a close-up of the corner joints. This is a mitered box joint or hakodome with shachisen, which are a type of key fitted which locks the joint inside. I think it's by far the strongest form of mitered corner joint. These piercing hammerhead draw bars lock the layers of the stand together and, and trap the pillow blocks. They're secured crosswise with comi sand or fixing pins. I make the pegs rectangular in section so that they're stiffer in the direction in which they are loaded. The frame had already received three coats of finish, so a little bit of work around this area, added a couple of coats which were feathered out into the surroundings, and then sanded down. I finished with a coat or two of wax, which is then buffed out with 4 off steel wool. Cork pads with PSA backing protect the floor against any possible scratches from the brass feet. Drawer construction on this cabinet is all mortise and tenon, and the drawer sides employ a applied runner which is held with a sliding hammerhead joint. Since these joints are wedged and won't be demountable, I'm assembling them using a more permanent sort of glue, namely a yellow glue. I think it's Type Bond 2. A few uh, wax with a dead blow hammer help get the parts together. I have a ridiculously heavy and large tri-square you can see in the background and with the aid of that I clamp the case together and get it all square before I put the wedges in.
fits between mortise and tenon are fairly tight, so there's not a lot of room for glue. Once it's seated, I then clamp the drawer and let it sit for an hour or two. And each drawer is then rechecked. Uh, most of the drawers fit fine afterwards, but the odd one, though it fit fine during dry fitting, uh, developed some slight areas of interference that needed adjusting. Any adjustments required were done with the plane. And the drawer fronts, by the way, are Curly Shadowa, which is a close cousin of Bubinga. After assembly, the drawer fronts receive their final two coats, bringing it up to five. These handles I obtained from a Tansu specialty supplier in Japan. They're made of bronze and are in Shibuichi finish. I put a little Loctite on to help secure the nuts in place. These handles come with little plastic caps, which I didn't really love and would have liked to have replaced uh, with maybe an acorn nut or similar. However, the threads themselves are not any known thread size. Uh, you would think they'd be three millimeter metric because threads in Japanese equipment are otherwise uh, in metric. But in this case, instead of three millimeters, they measured 2.83 millimeters and I couldn't find anything here that would uh, fit them. The upper portion of the cabinet has a pair of sliding doors. Uh, this is something I would say I borrow from Japanese traditional furniture. Uh, here I'm using a pattern of latticework called Matsukawa Bishi, which uh, Matsukawa meaning pine bark and Bishi meaning diamond. The panels in the back are Shedua. Miter twin tenon joints on the corners and they're curved on one side only for a wedge. These joints will be glued. This isn't exactly a normal setup in that I've stuck the paring block and the piece of wood together in a vise at an angle, but it happened to work with where I had the camera set up, so. Vertical grain bubinga can be difficult at times, but it was being compliant on, on this day at least. Similar to the way the drawers were done, the frames for the 
sliding doors were finished up to three coats then they're going to be glued up and I clean up the intersections a bit and add a final two coats to the exposed faces. The lattice work is not coated with varnish but simply waxed. I'm just placing the styles on lightly because they're going to get glued in a minute, so they're place holding. Because the styles and rails have their coats of finish on, uh, any slight amount of glue squeeze out is not a problem to deal with because it doesn't soak into the raw wood. After the wedges are fitted and the glue dries, the ends are cleaned off and they're fitted again to the cabinet carcass and checked for operation. The bifold doors were a challenging aspect of the build. They did offer several advantages, uh, including the ability to use a vertical grain panel and for the door to be able to be folded back 270 degrees to the side. Now these doors use pivots top and bottom which is borrowing from Chinese architecture uh, and Japanese architecture for that matter. Uh, however unlike those doors which have a uh, pivot pin that is directly in line with the style I've offset mine forward uh, 45 degrees and this allows the swing of the door to clear the sides of the cabinet. Drawing from Chinese practice, I make the back panels on my cabinets as separate frames which are demountable and they're fixed in place with clips. Uh, if ever the cabinet needs refinishing, for example, uh, the back panels can be simply removed and then it's much easier to do the finishing work.
Oh, Only. All right, yeah. Little bunnies goes over here. Over there. Yeah, over there. There you go. Over there. Okay. One can readily apprehend the advantages of unpaid labor. With all these drawers, the sides connect to the front with blind tenons, but equally one can do them with through tenons. In this case, a lot of through tenons sticking through might have made for an overly busy appearance, so I did them blind. the shelves now I've done these as frame and panel however originally they were done as single piece slabs but they didn't stay flat over time uh, so the only choice was to repurpose the slabs into panels and create curly frames and this is a much more stable arrangement these should last forever of course unless the cabinet set on fire or finds itself going down a river over a waterfall at some point here you can see how the doors are hung. There's a stainless steel pin that goes in a brass bushing at the top. In the top of the door itself is a threaded metal insert. The bottom of the door sits on a bronze pin and that in turn goes into a bronze sleeved, uh, no sorry, not sleeved, a bronze flanged bearing. I've arranged the grain on the doors uh, so they're, to me at least, they're reminiscent of a pair of tree trunks uh, at the base splitting off from one another. You'll see hopefully when the second door is closed up. I discovered my son likes opening and closing the doors. <laughs> 